Welcome to the Happy Hour Live webcast. It's Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock, and you know what that means. It's uh, time to put the job away for the weekend, in this case, a long holiday weekend in the U.S. Uh, I think it's a bank holiday weekend in uh, the U.K. and Europe, and uh, hopefully you're getting a long weekend wherever you are. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're watching in the world right now. I'm Mark Gillespie, and uh, we're going to have some fun for the next hour or so. Uh, before we get started, I'll uh, sort of share with you what I am drinking tonight. Uh, a uh, Canadian classic, the J.P. Weiser's 23-year-old Canadian whiskey, uh, in honor of a couple of things. Uh, Canada Day was yesterday, the uh, anniversary of Canadian Confederation. And also it's uh, Game 3 of the Stanley Cup Final tonight in Montreal. The uh, Canadians playing Tampa Bay. Montreal down two games to none and uh, really needs to win tonight. And... Uh, while I don't have a cheering interest in uh, the series overall, I really enjoy good hockey and I want to see it go seven games. So uh, tonight I'm drinking a Canadian whiskey in honor of the uh, Canadians and hoping for a good game tonight. So slan shit. If you, uh, hmm, excuse me, just a second, they went down the wrong pipe. It doesn't happen very often, but... Uh, if you have comments or questions, feel free to ask them in the uh, chat functions if you're watching on YouTube or the WhiskeyCast Facebook page. If you're watching us on Twitter or Twitch, we will uh, not see those until after the uh, webcast tonight. So uh, hold your questions or send them in and we'll try to answer them at a later date. Right now, we're joined by one of our guests tonight. Uh, David Ferguson is the commercial manager for the new Lockley Distillery in Scotland. Well, it's not new. It's been around for uh, three years or so, but uh, we'll be celebrating its third anniversary next month. And in all good Scottish terms, you know what that means. Uh, we will see the first Lockley release uh, very soon after that. Distillery manager Malcolm Rennie is going to join us uh, He's trying to get logged in from his place near the distillery in Ayrshire, which has a uh, high-tech uh, broadband connection to it that uh, we're still trying to get worked out. So we'll get him in here as soon as we can. But David, how are you tonight? Yeah, I'm great, Mark. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Malcolm is is still trying to to join us. He, um, I wasn't nervous about this at all until until Malcolm said I'm struggling to get in. So the technical questions will. We'll have to come to you. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed he joins us shortly. Well, we'll keep an eye out for him. Why don't you give us just a bit of the history for the many listeners out there and the folks who are not really up on the Lockley Distillery story? This has uh, an interesting heritage to it, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. So we, as a distillery, like you say, we're, we're nearing our uh, third anniversary of production. So we started August 2018. And since then, the guys have been, Malcolm and his team have been going about their business quite quietly. Um, so just producing the highest quality spirit that they can and not not really telling anyone about it. So um, when I when I joined the, the guys, I, um, you know, it was great. It was good for me to see, <laughs> you speak to someone like, a, you know, Ingvar who writes the Malt Whiskey Yearbook and he, he says, oh, you know, I hadn't heard of you guys. <laughs> okay. We've got some work to do here, um, but on the other hand, it's actually quite nice that we are we've stayed under the radar up until now. I think that that's been a conscious decision. So the the, the team and the owner didn't really want to shout about things until we had something to shout about a product, a whiskey to get into market. And um, so now now that now's the exciting part. I mean, we're we've got a six month plan between now and the the first release to to really get the name out there and and. Things like this are, are fantastic. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who, who, who listen to your podcast every week, Mark, that may have never heard of, of us at all. Um, so th this is great. And the, the other side of things, so the actual whiskey itself, um, we're, we're delighted with how that's coming along. We've got a, a release plan, which I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to later, which um, showcases the spirit in a few different ways over the next 18 months, two years. Um, and then a longer term plan to really grow from there. So yeah, it's exciting. How did you get involved with the distillery in the first place? So I, 
uh, I previously was was working with Beam Centauri, so a, a, a different different type of business altogether. And um, I actually sold Malcolm his casks for Loch Lee, so I knew I knew of the uh, of the distillery through a different route. Um, so I, actually, in that in that role was quite interesting. So my, my customers were three hundred distillers all over the UK, Europe, and North America, and buying casks and bulk whiskey and bulk other spirits as well. And so it, it gave me a good understanding of you know ha having three hundred master blenders or distillery managers as customers is a is a, a great for learning. And um, every every day you're you're working at what these guys uh, want from their their spirit and what casks they need to do that. And uh, I knew even before before I, I joined Lockley that they were they were doing everything the right way. Uh, so whether that is sourcing casks direct, not not. You know, buying from a cooperage where they've sat and dried out for weeks. It's uh, it, there's been no corners cut here, and and I really liked I liked the emphasis on quality of spirit, spirit over everything else. That that was a, a big big thing for me. So really, my 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 background was at Douglas Lane, an independent bottler. I'm sure you you, you know them well. Um, oh yeah. Moved to Beam for a while, was running their cask and bulk business, and then when I was approached about Loch Lee. There's a few things. I mean, first of all, the the being able being able to go in somewhere at the beginning. I mean, as a as a self-confessed whiskey geek long before I joined the industry, actually starting something from scratch and and you know, literally sitting with with customers saying, "Here is our new make. Here is uh, you know, fourteen different cast types. Here's a, here's the options we have." I, I love it. Um, I really do. And on the other operational side all of the the you know glass corks all that 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 part of it which i haven't really been involved much in in my career so far is again fascinating and and yeah i'm, le I'm learning a lot every day so that it was a no-brainer for me it's a it's a fantastic distillery great down to earth team the owner and, and his family are very supportive and, and very very nice people so it was um yeah there was no no, no question that i was going to join while we're waiting for Malcolm, I'm curious about the, the cask sales program, because that's one of the things we've never really gotten into, is how the distilleries get their casks, especially coming over from uh, the Beam Centauri distilleries in the States. Were you handling the brokerage for the casks from Jim Beam, or were you handling, like, say, the ex Lafroy Beaumore casks, things like that? Okay, everything, every cask that... that um that the beam centauri group no longer are uh, we're going to use or 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 even in some cases um casks that we would would buy in and broker for other people uh, so anything at all i mean we uh, at the time if, if beam had a, a bunch of tequila casks from alithco they, that they had to move that that was again me if it was curvoisi cast out from down in yarnak in france again that was me to find people that that wanted to buy those so um, I, I mean, there's certain within the Scotch whiskey industry that are certain companies to me that that place a really high emphasis on quality of, of their wood and what they're where they're sourcing from, and that that's a. Uh, I mean, we I don't want to, <laughs> to preaching to the converted here, but the, the the casks you use are such a such a big influence on what your your spirit is going to be like. That the people that invest heavily in that to me are doing the like the right thing long term. What were the easiest casks to get rid of when you had them? Uh, what could you tell somebody, hey, I've got X number of these casks, and people would just go, I want them now. I'll pay cash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th there were a few, to be honest. I mean, an anything that's um, that was a bit different or that they hadn't heard of before really was, was the, I mean, I, I was there at the time where the, the regulations were relaxed slightly as well. So all of a sudden... There were some options out there. I mentioned mezcal or tequila mezcal. These became uh, quite highly sought after. Suntory, as a Japanese business, have uh, you know some mezanara in the in the stocks there. So that is a uh, uh, not. That's where I was we, going next. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it, re really, really interesting. I remember um, I worked very closely with Ron Welsh, master blender for for being uh, for their Scotch portfolio. And Mizanara was a re really highly sought after, ve very expensive for for the casks. But the results that you could get if you if you timed it right, 
were, were unbelievable. But that timing was the, the window of when you had to get that out of there was, was quite uh, narrow in, in, in relative terms to, to other types of wood. And that was back when Suntory essentially controlled most of the Mizanara oak stock, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I can't remember the amount of times, Mark, that I, that I was contacted specifically about, you know, do, do you have any, regardless of price, we will take them. Um, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, we had to say we just, any that we do have are, are, being, are being used. Um, it was, yeah, very, very difficult. I think one or two um, customers over in Ireland, for example, that, that took some and have, have since since then released those whiskies and have been really really fantastic drams. But um, yeah, it's, it's a when you're spending that amount of money, it's a, a risk unless you keep a close close eye on it. Well, let's get back to Lockley now because uh, this distillery has a very unique place in Scotch whiskey history because of uh, the actual connection to the legendary bard, the one and only Robert Burns, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Burns is, a. I mean, it, it's quite often you, I'm, I'm cynical about these things, um, as I'm sure a lot of people are, but you, you hear marketing stories of, you know, not, not just in the whiskey industry, but uh, sort of tenuous links to people. And, but actually for us, this is about as genuine as it gets because they, uh, yes, Robert Burns himself lived and, and worked at Loch Lee um, from 1777 to 84, so at sort of 18 to 25 he was at the time, so his formative years when he really started um, showing his, his, his genius as a, as a poet were happening right here, uh, which is, is, you know, for me as a, as a local, a local boy, and in, uh, in always it's, um, it's pretty cool. And, and again, the the Burns side of things for us will be, we'll, we'll certainly talk about, I mean, I, I I could spend the next the next 45 minutes talking about Burns because I, per, I have a personal uh, interest and connection there. Um, I think well, we may the, have to, so go ahead. We, we've got time to kill here while waiting for <laughs> no, Malcolm, so go ahead. If Malcolm doesn't show up, I'll need to, the, the poetry will need to start soon. Um, no, I, I think certainly the Burns, the Burns connection is, is fantastic and we will there are certain times of the year that we will certainly, you know, use that and and, and get that that message out in, into particular markets. On the other hand, we do want to be known for the quality of our, our whiskey that we're producing first and, and foremost. And then, you know, if people link locally to the Burns side of things, great. Um, there, there's no Burns is is quite a, a he's he's used by a lot of people for a lot of different things so we don't we never want it to come across as if we are you know the <laughs> putting his silhouette on the bottle and, and hoping that, that that sells our spirit we we would rather sell the spirit first and then and then actually have a, a chat about about burns what one one interesting thing for me um mark in terms of the perception of burns and i don't know if this is just within the uk within scotland or f further afield but it, <laughs> Any anything you see, whether it's a TV program or a, a, a podcast or anything about him, it's the same. The same things get doled out again and again. Um, there's actually a lot more to his story than than is traditionally known. So, and um, for example, when he lived at Loch Lee, he was. I mean, he was a, the equivalent of the, the the kind of hipster of of his day in, in the late uh, 1700s. He was the only guy with a. He had, he had the mun before anyone had it nowadays, and. Um, was going to the local dance hall and all the rest. So, so this is uh, this is not a, a an old style twee guy. He was actually quite quite progressive and and uh, and, and passionate about obviously poetry and whiskey. Um, so some some of his values are have naturally come into our own as a company. And uh, we should point out that as at least as of now, Lockley does not have the endorsement from the Burns Trust, which I think is sort of the uh, the overriding, um, you might call it governing body for all things Burns in Scotland. Uh, there's another distillery over on an island nearby that has that, uh, but you never, that was before you guys came around. And that leads us to a question from Graham Fraser. How on earth did Lock Lee manage to stay under the radar for so long? Uh, yeah, good, good question, Graham. Um, 
so when I joined, I asked the same question. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, it was a, it was certainly a, a conscious decision. The guys have a, a team of three in production, Malcolm and his his uh, his two right-hand men, Darren and, and George. And these these guys have been just head down, working, working tirelessly to make spirit and I haven't had... Um, a person actually out there speaking to people so that that's a, a I guess a practical reason um, but secondly we, we wanted to wait until we actually had so right now and again great to be on something like like this where we can see look we have a whiskey coming very soon here's what it was going to be like here's where it's going to be sold and that that then uh, leads easily into the, the story I think if we were having this conversation two and a half years ago um, there wouldn't have been a, a whole lot to say <laughs> because we were we were just starting right. out. Um, so yeah, a conscious decision, but it's actually worked in our favour in a, in a strange way because we're we're relatively secret within the, the Scotch industry. And that even leads to uh, the public profile. You have not had tours available, or you've not opened up the distillery, and that leads us to a question from uh, Chris Ratcliffe. What has the public reaction been for those who do know about Lockley, and uh, have people already been trying to get a hold of an early bottle from you? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. I've, um, so, so, I mean, within the trade, so whether it's UK retailers or some of our import partners that we're we're going to work with, the the reaction has been has been great. I mean, I. I sent out a few samples to some um, some people within the industry that I know and trust really trust their their view on it and the feedback was unanimously positive um, I, you know Malcolm uh, the owner Neil and I sat around and tried some some samples and you know we, we're we're sitting there in the distillery with a vested interest waxing lyrical about what we're what we're sampling so we thought we need to get a third part you know get an external opinion on this um, right. and that was even sending those out is you know you're it's a bit of a, a like okay let's wait and see we um, but no, it's been fantastic, and some of the uh, the retailers that you know we're, we're already there's over 120 retailers in the UK have, have already asked for stock of the first release. We've got 10 import uh, importers that are um, going to work with across different markets. It's really been um, overwhelming, to be honest, re really uh, in a good way. Just just really really exciting. I think for, and I'm sure he would say this if he could get his broadband to work, but. Um, for Malcolm to, to spend all this time for, for three years trying to, to really uh, build something and then for people to come back and say, you know, what you're producing is is stunning, then that, you know, I can't imagine what, how, how he must feel at that point. Um, it's great. I, I get excited about it and I, I've not I've not touched a, a dial on that, that spirit safe. Well, if you want to take a quick second and check in with him via text and see what's going on with his connection, we can uh, kill a few seconds here and we'll uh, show some folks what the uh, distillery looks like because uh, your colleagues were, this is actually the farm in Ayrshire, south of Kilmarnock, where the distillery is located. And uh, it's, uh, I think your guys are growing your own barley, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we grow all of our barley on the farm. It's a, a, a working farm, so the our owner is literally out out, out in the field, uh, you know, d doing that. So all of our uh, production is is Loch Lee barley. So we, whereas you know there are distillers who will will say it's um, they use local barley or they use, they use uh, from near near the area. With us, it's literally. I mean, in that picture, you can see the the, the still house behind the glass there. If, if that camera pans to, to the right, we have 220 acres that is is growing the barley that we will then use for the, the spirit. So it's, yeah, I mean, that that is a, again, I think everyone now talks about traceability and, and you know, wanting to know where each of the ingredients comes from to make something that, for us, that's easy because we just walk across the, the car park and show them. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, those uh, look familiar. It looks like Forsyths, right? Yes. Yeah. Everything um, within the still house was was custom made and, and uh, fitted by the guys at Forsyths. And I think that again, I mentioned earlier about you know we're, we're trying to do things in the right way, whether that's where we source casks or or um, even the way that we 
mature or stock it's all on site it's, it's racked there is some dunnage but it's it's um it's rack racking is not <laughs> certainly not not the cheapest way you could you could palletize things and be economical but you don't there's a lot of negative aspects to that and similarly with the wooden washbacks there we're, we're six big old douglas fir washbacks that are um you know again we could have gone stainless steel and um, easier to clean a bit cheaper and, and done it that way but malcolm was was adamant that that's not the type of spirit he wants to to create so yeah the, the inside um is is basically a, a re recondition i mean that that area that building was was there but in a very different state um, and it's been uh, upcycled i guess into um, what's now a fantastic distillery and this was original farm buildings right that were still there for uh, that had been repurposed right Absolutely, yeah. So the the site, um, there are still buildings that we have plans for that aren't aren't even yet um, haven't yet been repurposed. But the the distillery itself that you see there, yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, we're we're quite fortunate that we have the space to to do those sort of things. So when when I mentioned like the warehousing being on on site, um, we're actually building our we're in the process of building our second warehouse. So you know some some distilleries i guess if you got to a certain size you might have to go and, and outsource that or, or you know use a, a third party uh, bonded storage for us we it's important for us that we keep it there so um yeah again just very fortunate in the setup that we have uh, i i just got a, a message there mark where we're chatting from mark so i i think he he's still having issues um so i think if he if he appears at some point then then great but i, I can only apologize to your your viewers because I know they Well tell him we'll take him however we can get him to connect. If it's yeah. even if it's a rough yeah. connection, we'll take him. Yeah, I can I can always so, hear the time. Because I haven't even people. seen him connect in. So and he must be having trouble getting connected to the internet at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm apology. I mean the uh, I'm sure everyone everyone probably signed in to, to hear see and hear Malcolm and his 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 experience. So there um, apologies that you're you're stuck with uh, oh. with me. Graham Fraser makes a great comment that it reminds him a lot of the Daft Mill project. And is I know that that was pretty much a farm project where they waited 12 years to bottle the first whiskeys from Daft Mill that uh, yeah. Francis and his uh, team put together. But it seems very similar in that uh, it's another farm distillery, grain to glass, where they're growing all the grain on there. And that really seems to be sort of a, a, a small trend that we're seeing in Scotland again as a return to the... Uh, the farmer slash distiller days of the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a really good point. So the Daft Mill, I mean, I know Francis at Daft Mill, they have a, again, fantastic spirit and, and everything is is traceable there. You can, you know, exactly where things have come from. I think the, I guess the difference between Loch Lee and Daft Mill for me would be that we, um, you know, Francis will, will, Distill at certain times in the year, and he has he has other uh, other things going on in, on the farm. For us, we are hundred percent. You know, we're we're distilling uh, for forty eight weeks of the year, and we want we're probably going to be a bit um, yeah, a slightly different scale. But certainly in terms of the the philosophy and ethos behind it, yeah, absolutely great grain to glass and a working farm, which which also is is distilling. And just to clarify for BMO, who said, resend a link. Um, it's not the link that's the problem. It's that uh, Malcolm's having trouble getting connected to the internet in the first place. Uh, yeah, so uh, once we get him connected to the internet, he can click the link, but we got to get him something above dial up first to make it work properly. So yeah. uh, we will get there. But uh, Chris Ratcliffe has a good question. Is there a desire with this initial release to under promise and over deliver rather than start talking about this thing as you could have done two, three years ago, build up all the hype and hoopla and put your early reputation on the line if it didn't live up to all that. Uh, that that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly not, we, I, I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to under promise. If anything, I'm probably guilty of the opposite. We're <laughs> trying to, uh, Try, I, I'm I'm so excited about the project that it's difficult for me to. It would be difficult for me to underpromise. I think. Um, so certainly, the with the way the spirit is coming along and the feedback that we're getting, I, I certainly think there's you know there's there's plenty of of uh, 
of scope here to to grow and to grow the company and to to get out into to market. And, you know, I know you obviously based in the US, Mark, and, and it's a that will be a big market for us. And and um, I, I would, you know, if I if I tell people that the, I think this spirit is great, and I think the the cast expression that we're sending over to the US is is great, I'm I'm hopeful that people will agree. <laughs> I mean, if they obviously everyone is is different, but um, no, we'll I, let you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know you, I know you well, and and actually that, I mean, that sort of the whiskey industry is good, good for that. People are are very, very honest in their feedback, and um, and we we as a company want to be very honest in the way that we present things. So there'll be no there'll be no hiding behind any any sort of marketing here. Um, we don't even have a marketing manager, so it's not even possible. Um, but we we want to we want to be be as open and transparent with people about what. What we do, where it's come from, um, the types of casks used, everything. Because I think, I mean, personally, I that's that's what I like when I'm if I'm buying a whiskey, if it's a you know if it's a, a spring bank or a, a you know they mentioned Daft Miller, if you can if you know where everything comes from and and these guys have clearly put a lot of care and attention into to making that, then it's a different. Well, t- to me personally, it's a different feeling buying that 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 whiskey um, as it would be to going down a more sort of mass market route. Another question from Graham. Can the farm supply enough barley to keep you busy year round or will you have to supplement? Yes, great question. So the, um, yeah, yes, it can. And, and it has done for the past couple of years. The We ha- we do have a backup plan. So if for whatever reason, you know, Scotland, uh, the weather is not 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 exactly predictable. So if, if there was a, a year where we didn't have the yield that we were expecting, then we do have a backup plan, and, and that that backup plan is the next farm right next to us. So rather than us saying it, it all came from these fields here, we would just have to point to one field over the fence. So, so it would still be it would still be very local, but um, but but not I suppose not technically all locally. But we, we certainly we understand we have we understand that we have to have a. a you know, a way of, of doing that if for whatever reason, as I say, the the yield for one year didn't didn't quite match up. And you have cleared that with the other farm, right? That they could be <laughs> a backup. You're not just gonna go uh, send the combine over in the middle of the night and yeah, we need a few thousand bushels of your bear your barley here. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's clear the, the owner Neil has told me it's cleared. Um so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take his word for it. But yeah, yeah, the guys actually even I know whiskey as an industry is uh, well. It's it's full of nice people, and and it's um, you know everyone helps each other out. Even if you are, and I've experienced this a lot since I joined Lockley. But even if you are a, a, a direct competitor of someone, we can still pick up pick up the phone to each other, get advice. We can um, yeah. you know, so and and it's similar actually in the in the kind of agriculture side of of things here. And um, so Neil is, has great re- relationships with. The guys all around um, the the Ayrshire community as well. So I'm sure even even if if that other field had an issue, then we would we would we'd move across to the other side and we would find it find it somehow. How do you make a name for Lockley in what Chris Ratcliffe pointed out is a booming Scotch whiskey market right now? We've got all these uh, new small distilleries coming online like Daft Mill that we talked about earlier. How do you make a name for Lock Lee and uh, stand out among all of the uh, the competition? Yeah, that's a fair point. I, so there are certainly um, certainly a lot of new distillers out there right now. That That's yeah, no, no secret. I think it, it, it's interesting. So if I, if I, if we were a, a the scale of a, a rose isle or a um you know one of the like a delmanach or one of these big 14 15 million liters a year type production i, I probably would have some, some concerns over you know where is this stuff going to go is it you know the blended category is declining um is there a you know what, what's the way out of this for us as a small relatively small um and, and in small batch production single malt distillery I, I think there is still a market for us and I, I, I certainly hope there is or or i'll be out of a job um but i, I think the, w- the way that we carve out our niche is 
to tell people the, the, the very open and honest story about us, get people to the site and show them what we do and and hopefully that the and um, some of the natural I know we spoke about this before Mark, but some of the, the natural trends within the industry of of premiumization, traceability, sustainability as well. We we just naturally fall into a lot of those categories, which is um, I'm hoping will allow us to, to carve out a nice niche. And and really, I mean, the other thing that I've, I mean, you, you can't see, I've, I've got 75, 80 bottles on, on, on my left-hand side here. Um, no, no one, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your, your viewers and listeners, no one has one brand of whiskey on the shelf. Um, you know, we, we, we oh, just no. want to be one of <laughs> we we want to be one of them, uh, one of the ones on there, and and even even at that point, there are you know there, there's some fantastic other new distillers out there. We know the guys at, at, up at Rassi very well. I tried their their release, and it's you know fa fantastic liquid. The some of the cask uh, profile stuff they're doing is really interesting. And um, Lindor's just you know re releasing today. The, the, to me, this is good. This is good. I mean, this is getting people trying younger whiskies and um, trying very different styles and, and hopefully then you know if people gradually move towards that side of things and, and trying smaller batches and r rather than the the more traditional bigger uh, brands which are you know have their place but are just you know made, made for consistency we want to bring something unique to the market quite quite different in terms of flavor. Great question from our pal Tyrone Cote, and he's asking this from Nova Scotia. So that explains part of this question. He wants to know about the annual production levels at Lockley because he's wondering how likely he is to see it outside of Scotland. Obviously, in Atlantic Canada, you're probably not going to see much of it, but you've already mentioned you've got importers in, what, 10 different markets looking to get this? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a good question. I think... For us, the um, so the capacity is two hundred thousand liters a year, which in relative terms is is not huge, but it's not you know it's it's not tiny. Um, there are there are some distilleries where the production is is so small that it becomes you know single casks here and there, and and you know, almost almost by the cases going into different markets. We we're I'd like to think we're at a, we will be at a different level to that, um, so. Certainly, with the markets that we're speaking to, and um, we've picked, we strategically picked those ones to, to really start from and, and build. One of which is is, is Canada. So, um, Tyrone, hopefully, we can find a way to you. Um, but the, the the first release, I mean, I think the first release, it's for us. It is, I mean, it's fantastic, and it really it gets the name out there. And um, personally, I I can't wait for the beginning of 2022 when we have our core single malt whiskey and we can actually start building the brand. Um, the first release for the batch that we are gonna bring out, I, I don't mean this to come across in uh, sounding arrogant in any way, but we, we could have sold a lot more than we're producing for that. It, it's it's you know, certainly on allocation, but that's, I think, you know, you, you don't want to be seen as, okay, we're being greedy because we're just, we just increased the, first release batch way up but actually we want people that buy the first one to hopefully then buy our, our core product and the batches that we bring out after that and um, so yeah it's, it's a really good point we'll, we'll try and get as much to those key markets as possible obviously for, for us the the UK side of things will will be big but when we're talking about the the inaugural uh, bottling there's a decent there's a decent allocation set aside for um, for most markets, or for, for all of the markets that we're going into. Great question from Frank Murphy. And I think this is our pal Frank Murphy who runs the pot still in Glasgow. And I could be wrong about that, but I don't think I am. He wants to know if the goal is just to use all the grain that Lockley Farm or the local area can produce, or is it to achieve a specific sales target or something else, uh, world domination, something like that? Yeah. No, thank you, Frank. I, 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 yeah, I know. I know, Frank. I'm, I, it'd be nice if we were actually sitting doing this in Frank's pub, Mark. Um, oh yeah. 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 No, it's a great question. So the the, I mean, yeah, the first part of that, yes, certainly we, will, you know, it's a working farm and using the grain to make whiskey is a is a commercially sensible thing to do. Um, actually, when when Neil started up uh, the, the company, the 
the initial thought was we'll maybe do some contract distilling. We'll sell barley. We'll we'll kind of work that way. This is I mean, you know I'm talking seven seven six seven years ago now, and then it became apparent that actually let's let's do the whole thing here and let's uh, really really go for it. So he he took a, a, the decision at that point to bring everything uh, under the, the control of, our, of the company. And um, so they the I mean there are a few goals we have a we have quite a clear ambitious plan for the next 15 20 years of how we want to find that way in the market and 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 grow not only the core product but you know once we get to to having age statement whiskies and so that there's a there is a very yeah a very clear plan to to grow into the market we don't we're not going to get carried away and think that we can become uh, something something massive overnight it's just you need to build from the first bottle through to uh, through to the cases through to the pallets and, and work your way up but yeah it's a re really good question i mean i think the owner neil and, and i often kind of talk about this there if you started a new distillery right now and you didn't have a a, a purpose behind it a reason for it then yeah you, you know understand where frank's coming from then the, you you probably question where are we going here but i want to yeah make, make it clear we have a, we know exactly where we want to be in the next the next decade and beyond that and and we want Lough Lee to be here way beyond a, you know when, when we will be certainly we're, we're custodians for a few years uh, we've not had a lot of good lowland whiskies especially from that part of the lowlands in a long time uh, to be honest, basically Ayrshire was where you drove through coming out of Glasgow on your way down to catch the ferry over to Cam to Isla or just to stop in Campbellton. But uh, with this, Nikki White has a great question. What is unique about Ayrshire and how is this going to impact Lockley Whiskey? Tell us about, I hate to use the T word for terroir, but what is the terroir in this area that's going to make this whiskey unique? Yeah, great question. So the I mean, I, I'm. I need to caveat this because I'm I'm from Ayrshire, and um, so I I, uh, I don't want to sound as if I work for the Ayrshire Tourist Board with the answer. But um, I, yeah, having lived away for for a long time and worked away, and then the, my wife and I are finally moving back here. I I actually took the area for granted when I grew up, and I'm sure a lot of people do this. But you, you know, we we have within the area where Loch Lee sits, it's. It's you know you, you feel as if you're in a remote countryside location, but you're actually half an hour south of, of Glasgow one way, and uh, and really close to some of the biggest west coast towns in Scotland and the other. So it's a it's a nice balance of being remote but but quite accessible. And um, in terms of the, the you mentioned terroir there, so the the land, Ayrshire is is known for its its agriculture. That is that's one of the things that we're really well known for. That that and. And golf and um, having three open championship courses within a, a half hour drive so um i think particularly for the us i have a, a, quite a few friends from from your side of the water and most of them like whiskey and golf so um ayrshire is a is a, a holiday destination for them and um, so yeah the, the area itself in terms of whiskey is certainly uh, we we are we are the only people doing what we're doing here and uh, obviously you have William Grant's down in, in Girvan, um, sort of further south, d doing a very different thing. But in terms of our our scale and our, our approach, uh, yeah, we, we are we are kind of unique in that sense. And I mean, it, it, Ayrshire's a it's known as the sunshine corner of Scotland. I know that sounds like a <laughs> like a, a bit of irony in there, but the, it is. We have a kind of microclimate here, so I don't know whether that Neil would be. A, Better place to answer whether that does help with the way that we we grow our barley and and you know as the Loch Lee barley is unique to our spirit because we don't sell it out anywhere else so that that is one of the things that will contribute to having to, to deflate the final flavor in our product. And that brings us to a question from Patrick: Since you do grow your own barley, are there plans to experiment with different types of barley in the future? Such as uh, as Patrick points out, such as Brook Laddie has done in the past over on Isla. Yeah, so that that is a good good point. We right now the we're going to continue using our own um, un, unless something out, out with our our control happens, I guess. But uh, 
We well, I mean, can you grow different, different types? Can you decide we're going to do a different strain this year or next spring? Of course. Of course. And do something no, like I, that. And Absolutely. So we, we currently, it's, it's Laureate that we are, we're growing this year and, and, and we did last year as well. But yes, certainly we, there is no reason why, I mean, um, the owner is very experienced in that side of things. So he, he could, he could experiment. I think if we, if we were doing that, it might be on a, a smaller scale. We, we, we wouldn't switch over our, our whole production to, to one, one type, but certainly, you know, I, I like, I like the way Bruce Laddie do, do that. The, and it's interesting to try two things that are kept as as similar as possible with, with that one variable. And um, so we could certainly do that in future. I think the biggest thing for us right now is that we're producing this highest quality spirit and, and that is consistent. But then the different uh, showcasing that in different cast types and that that side of it is is kind of where we're going to, to start off. But yeah, in, in future, no reason why we couldn't go down that road. Frank's being cheeky tonight. Um, he wants to know if there, he thinks there, if you think there'll be a marketing benefit of leveraging the distillery's proximity to Kilmarnock, given its latent awareness from Johnny Walker bottles, and of course, uh, Kilmarnock hasn't appeared on those bottles in uh, several years since they closed their facilities in Kilmarnock. But uh, do you get to play off that a little bit, or do you play off of, uh, say, uh, Troon over to the west by the shore? Uh, so, in answer to Frank's question, no. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I, I'm yeah, personally, I, I live in, in I'm from here, so it's it's uh, here in Kilmarnock are, are like, um, yeah, there's a there's a bit of a, an old old rivalry there. They're, they're two quite <laughs> quite different. Like places. Glasgow and Edinburgh. Yes, yeah, maybe slightly worse. Not something. quite the not quite the Celtic Rangers level of rivalry. Oh no, but, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. You could. Um, I feel safe driving through there. Um, no, I, I, it's yeah. There's certainly there is history there. I mean, what uh, what Frank's saying is, is absolutely so. The the Johnny Walker site there was 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 huge and actually was um, had a, had a massive part to play in the, the growth of the. The industry, particularly for obviously for that brand, but that category. So, the, yeah, the, there's there will be some people who maybe um, make that that historic link. But we're, I think, we're so different in what we're producing and what we're, you know, the the the, the area of the whiskey industry that we're moving into is so different. I don't think we'll be compared. Um, if we ever get to that scale, then things have gone very well. Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, what's your style with regards to wood? What kind of casks are you using? And uh, I've got to ask on that front, since you used to sell casks for a living, did you uh, have any specific knowledge that helped you uh, acquire casks for Lockley? Um, so, yeah, for, to the first part, uh, for Chris's question, I, I um, so the, there, are, there are a few things. First of all, the, the core expression that we... <laughs> That we're ninety nine percent sure that we're going to go down that route, and um, has a particular cast profile that Malcolm has has designed, and and it relates obviously to our, our stock management, but it it works particularly well with our spirit, um, and that that route is has some first fill bourbon and some fresh first fill bourbon in there, and there is some there's a sherry influence. I won't I won't say, say which type at this stage, but that that particular ratio that we're working to right now has a has a it just works it just works great i mean it's actually it brings through so when you have our new make which is bursting with fruit and it's it's all that you know that orchard fruit pears oranges really really juicy but actually has a lot of body to it it's not it's not a, a you know very typical lowland light style and um, so when you put that into first film obviously you, you know well, your, your viewers will know exactly what, what happens there it, it, it really takes on a life a, a new life and then with the other also, it, it then, for me, it changes. I've just said the sherry there, so I've given away the game. It, it just it just then takes on a whole different uh, texture as well. So it becomes, you, you go from trying, you know, first of all, bourbon, nice and, and fresh, and uh, the fruit is really, really coming through. But then some other also influence gives it almost like a, to me, it's like a creaminess. It's, it, it's, it goes from being your, your that pear, orange, juicy fruit, through to something that's more like strawberries, cream, that that 
people, I mean, I know there'll be some people watching that are saying, listen to this guy talking, uh, talking nonsense, but that, that to me, that's why. And, and there'll, oh, be just will, there'll, <laughs> there'll be a lot of people trying it. Um, hopefully when it, when we do release that, that have different perceptions, but that to me, it's a, it's a really nice balance that, that comes through. So, um, yeah, it, it, the, ca the cask say the things that I, I could, I could talk all night about this, but we, even with their bourbons, they are, as I said earlier, they're fresh, they're straight from the site. They're, we use a lot of Maker's Mark casks, so they're tipped in Loretto, Kentucky. They're straight on the, the, the container and, and they're over to us. They don't, they don't go via, a, I know, a cooperage for five weeks and sit outside or anything. We, we just, we get them as, as they are. Um, and likewise, we source all our sherry from a one, one particular supplier that we know well. So we have 14 different cast types that we can we can see over the next the next few months and years how how our spirit works with those and we'll we'll go with that so long way of answering the question but yeah the wood is is vitally important in what we want to do since you are probably i would assume one of the few people between you neil the owner and malcolm who has actually tasted the lockley whiskey so far what does it compare to? What might we be able to uh, get some comparisons to from other more familiar scotches that we've tried? What's it in the neighborhood of? Good question. So I I mentioned earlier about the what, what I would class as that typical lowland style. I I I don't think we are that at all. And I, I mean, the, it's not like a blad knock. <sighs> No, and and I don't I don't want that to. I mean, I I like nothing against Black Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want to to um, come across as if we don't. You know, we're actively trying not to be other other brands. But um, certainly for me, the the spirit profile is is so we we have a a long ferment. We have a high narrow cut point. We do a lot of things so that that the fruit that you mentioned. So that really. I know full bodied is not really used a lot, but but it's that it's really there's a lot to it. There's a lot of um, a lot of juiciness there, and, and it's it's it lends itself well to various different cast types, and that that's that's done. I mean, that's done on on purpose. Malcolm has produced that certain style. The in terms of comparisons, I mean, it's it's difficult. So I'm I'm trying our spirit right now at two and a half years old, in in various different cast types. It, it, it's tricky at that point to, you know, unless you have an equivalent from a from another distiller to, to really yeah. uh, compare. Malcolm, I mean, he he would he would probably go down the route of saying, well, if you had to find another distillery that's producing a, a type of spirit that that um, is is really well known and, and obviously is well is reopening soon, that would be like a Rosebank, for example, that that style where it's 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 very. Uh, it is relatively light, but there is there's body there. It's not a, uh, it's not the grassy herbal lowland that you you would kind of be, you would expect from some of the uh, the more traditional styles from down here. It really is unfair to make the comparison because uh, every distillery is unique and different, and you could do something with your still shape and yeast type and barley that's very similar to something up in the Highlands that's not even close to what Bladnock is. And it's really not a fair comparison to make to another distillery only because of that uniqueness that each distillery has. Uh, so here's the question from Tabitha, our pal south of London. She's sold. When can she get a bottle? When is this going to hit the market? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, th thank you very much for that. Um... Yeah, I'm delighted that, that she's keen to, to get one. And um, so that the first release is is due out at the end of this year. That will be our, our inaugural bottling, and um, so that will be a batch that goes to into the UK, but also the the, uh, the various importers that we're working with. And then the core product, the core Lockley single malt, will be the, the beginning of 2022. And um, so quite quite, there's not going to be a huge gap between the two. We want to get the first release out there, let people try the spirit in what is another different uh, way in terms of cask, but then quite quickly show them what is going to be our signature style. Um, and then be beyond that, next year, 
we have a release plan for um, three three batches, which will be separate from the core, um, but different cast types, different styles. So really, you can have you can buy Lockley single malt at any time. That will be the core product. But we will over the next you know over the next few years we'll release in, in fairly um, you know fairly irregular intervals. We'll, we'll bring out some batches of showcasing the spirit. So we don't we're not going to bring out something every two weeks or you know it'll, it'll be three maybe three a year type thing to really show people what what we can do here and I, actually the most exciting thing for me and for, for for Tabitha there that asked the question I think is that we we as a company will be on that journey together so we, we don't you know we're, we're confident that we have good spirit we're buying good wood all the rest of it but we will be trying this at the same time as you <laughs> So for a lot of the, the, the things, I mean, our, our cast program that we just launched last week, which has been phenomenal so far, a lot of the guys that I'm speaking to, uh, I say guys as a club, I mean, men and women, um, a lot of people we're speaking to are... Gender neutral guys. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they are, I mean, they're asking asking what sort of, you know, what, what do you think the spirit will be like in 10 years and 12 years? I can... Malcolm and I can give a, a, a rough idea, but really we will be trying that together. When they come to see their cask and draw a sample with us and pop the bung and see, they, we'll, be, we'll be trying that together, um, which I think is quite a nice thing. It's not um, it's not, not predetermined by any means. Graham has another question. What was the thinking behind the stills size and shape? And let me expand on that. How much influence did Malcolm have on this or did he come in after Neil had already placed the order with Forsyth. Good point. So the, so the to answer your point, Mark, first, the, the Malcolm was involved right from the beginning. So he he was there to, to design with the guys at Forsyth and, and with the architect on the building exactly where every pipe was laid and, and everything. And similarly, that's, you know, that's what he did at Kilhoman. He set up the place. He decided where everything went and, and, that, that brand has has grown from strength to strength, and um, so so that yeah he he was there at the beginning and it's very much his his design. Um, in terms of the spirit, so the actual shape of the stills, I know there's a lot uh, yeah, there's a lot a lot said about it in the industry. I mean, I um, did a IBD certificate. I'm sure a lot of people have, have have gone through that, and it's it's fascinating the difference that that spirit um, that your stills can make. For us, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say the stills are, uh, are are one of the points I would highlight highlight as being a, a big differentiator. We have, as you could as you saw in the picture, actually fairly traditional shaped stills. They are relatively tall. Um, it's maybe tricky to see in that, but you do have a slight descent on the the, the the line arm there. But they are tall, so you're still you know the the, the vapors having to work hard to, to get up there and um, so they the stills I mean there's a few it's funny a lot of these things uh, I've been around a lot of distilleries and the some of the, the the stills that are in a space are, are in because they fit in that space and 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 people um, you know work from there work with what you've you've got we were in a different position where we could design it to a, a spec which is was was great and um, yeah Malcolm Malcolm has has put those together with the guys at first size for exactly the type of spirit character that he wanted to get from them. And let's uh, take a quick question here from, uh, from well, our pal Tyrone in Nova Scotia. He's a member of the Association of Halifax Regional Scotch Enthusiasts, or ARSE, and they're heading to Scotland next May, and they'd like to know if they could stop in for a visit. Yeah, absolutely, Tyrone. So you uh, please send. We've got uh, on our website. There's a there's an info address there. Please please get let us know when you're when you're coming across. I, I know we said earlier that we're not open to the public. Um, we're we're just we're we're a relatively small team right now, and the focus is on on that first release. And um, certainly, you know, if if people like Tyrone are, are showing such an interest in coming, especially coming all that way. We'll find a way of, of getting getting them in here and, and showing them around. And um, we have had some people within within the trade, some of our future customers around the site, and 
it's all set up there. I mean, we have the exact route that we take, but, you know, you can see the barley, you can go into the grain shed, the warehouses are on site, everything is there. So uh, please send us, a, send us a note on the website, Tyrone, we'd be more than happy to accommodate. Tyron, I'll put you in touch with David. You can, we'll set it up for you. Um, Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, when you're starting from zero, how is the, how do you make the decision for something as important as, and as iconic as your bottle design? And I'm not going to ask you to reveal that bottle design. Hell, you may not even have a mock-up ready yet, but how do you go about designing that first bottle for what's going to set the stage for Lockley single malt for the next 20, 30 years? Yeah, it's a very, very relevant question, Chris. Um, I mean, even as early as yesterday afternoon, we were on a, a call with, we're working with a really good company on that. Um, but it's, I mean, it's it's a fascinating process. There are so many things that go into it. Um, I mean, we want to create something that is unique in terms of the, the, the look and feel and, and, and has some standout shelf presence. But we we're not as a company a, a a shouty show-offy group of people so we we don't our brand will not reflect that you know we want we want to make sure that it's a something classic that can stand the test of time as well so it's it's a it's a really interesting process it's it can be frustrating there's there are so many variables in there um i'm sure the industry as a whole right now with with lead times for glass and uh, corks and everything they, you know that there are challenges but i think we're at a stage now where we have something we're we're all very happy with and we're now into into production for the the bottles and so we we, we kind of wait wait and see but yeah it's a, it's been another another part of it that's been fascinating and i think when you're in this you're in this bubble of you know looking at drawing technical drawings every day for for weeks and months actually what we did is started showing it to other people and, and saying to our customers, you know, look, what what do you think of this? You've never, you've not laid eyes on it before. And they would, they would, their impression is almost more important than what we're thinking at that point. Cause we are just so immersed in, uh, you know, picking every detail apart, but no, we, we're, we're almost there with that. And um, certainly on the bottle, we are there and, and the labels final tweaks, but we're, I think we'll have something that's, that's quite, quite stunning once it's um, in people's hands. Tabba had a quick question, types of washbacks. We addressed that earlier, Douglas Fir. Um, Daniel Caballero, interesting question. Any peat in the horizon? Yeah, good point, Daniel. So we, th there's two, two different uh, answers to this. Um, first of all, we will, we will have a peated expression probably around autumn time next year. Um, and that, that won't actually be peated spirit. So what we're doing is putting... We already have put our spirit into um, some ex Lafroig barrels and, and some ex Lafroig quarter casks to to just give that um, that influence. But we actually have also talked about having a, a whether it's a peak week or a, you know I know there's other distillers do this now, but a, a few weeks of the year where we we make peated spirit. Malcolm is a you know he, he grew up on Isla. He's worked at Bruce Laddie and and our big heat. He knows he knows how to make peated whiskey. So so there I think right now or, or for the next over the next 18 months it will be based on the cask rather than the spirit. But certainly beyond that we're 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 gonna plan to bring bring something quite interesting out that I mean the other thing, Mark, is Neil, our, our owner, his family, they, they work they live on the site and his wife Jen probably doesn't want to open the window in, in the morning and have Peat wafting in while the kids are trying to eat their breakfast. So we, uh, oh, they'll we get have... used to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so right, right now the Lafroy casts are a good option, but certainly we're yeah we're we're pushing for doing something quite interesting with the the, the spirit. And actually, even on that point, so the different an ex Lafroy barrel has has been used for Lafroy ten. So essentially, I mean, it's a refill barrel, but it's it's only ever had five years of bourbon, 10 years of Lafroy. So it's not, it's got lots of life left. The ex Lafroy quarter casks are, are something quite different because they are just by the nature of quarter casks, they're, they're stripped apart, the staves are put back together um, and there's a lot more of the bourbon influence there. So e even within those two cask types, we could bring out very different expressions. Um, but yeah, there, there will be, so again, long way of answering this, 
Daniel, but we, we will have a petted expression for you to try next year. Tabitha had a great question. Um, Tomatin has been experimenting with chocolate malt recently. Of course, Glen Morangy has done that. Other distillers have done it as well. Is that something you guys would consider since you are growing your own grain? And I'll expand on this one as well. Might you consider having your own floor maltings at some point? If you're doing your own grain, why not uh, malt it on site? Yeah, that's a, that's a good good question. So we, the, in, in terms of, sort of the tab of this question about the chocolate malt, we right now, um, we're not using that that type, but but certainly there is no, I think this is one of the great things about the, a business like ours, independent, family owned. If Malcolm has an idea, if I have an idea, we literally walk through or we pick up the phone and say to Neil, can we do this? And more often than not, he'll say, yeah, go for it. Um, so that, there's not we don't really rule anything out um in terms of the the malt floor so this is a the only part of our process that happens outside of the, the boundaries of Loch Lee is 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 the malting and um, we send it a, to a well-known maltster nearby and, and it comes straight back but we actually did get a quote for a, a, a drum maltings we could we could have um, got something installed there and right now I mean the guys the, the, there's been over six million pounds investment in the, the site yeah. and you're talking another 1.2 or you know for, for to get your own maltings this is it's not a priority right now but again there's no there's no reason why we might not look at that again in future once we have once we've built up our um, our brand in the market I, I i i think having i mean it's great to, to walk around and tell people that everything literally everything happens here is is fantastic we are 95% of the way there. Um, at some point, it may become 100. Um, I, I mean, even some of the, you know, my previous employer, when the Beaumont and, and Lefroy, they, they malt their own stuff, but it's a it's a fraction of what they yeah. what they use. It's a it's it's nice for tourists to go in, and I've been you know in the in the kiln there and and rolling around in the barn. It's, it's fun, um, but it's you know in, in relative terms, it's you know 10% of what they use. So we're we would we would probably go the whole hog and, and do it all or or just keep keep the structure as it is. We'll talk offline because I know a maltings in uh, the Pacific Northwest where they developed a uh, machine that essentially is a craft scale drum maltings that can be done in the size of a small shed. Okay, wow. And uh, and they were actually talking about marketing the machinery to smaller distilleries outside of the U S we'll talk. I'll put you in touch with them. Okay, uh, we have had a lot of comments, uh, that you have been a more than able deputy for Malcolm tonight. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk offline, but when time comes for that annual review, have Neil talk to me, we'll put in a good word for you because, uh, David, you have done a great job tonight, uh, filling in for Malcolm who, could not join us because of internet connection issues in Ayrshire. But uh, thank you, David, for joining us tonight. Uh, David Ferguson from Lockley Distillery. We will have more on Lockley on this weekend's episode of Whiskey Cast. Uh, David alluded to it earlier. We did an interview earlier where Malcolm was able to join us. And you'll hear that this weekend on uh, Whiskey Cast as well on the regular podcast. So, David, Thank you for joining us. Good luck with Lockley. Can't wait to try the inaugural release and the core range when they come out next at the end of the year. Thank you. And, and to you too, Mark. I'm sorry I wasn't joining you. My wife's expecting in two weeks I'm on the water in case I have to jump hey, off and drive. Congratulations. Good luck. Um, <laughs> Thanks. As someone who's been there, make sure she trims her fingernails before she leaves for the hospital. <laughs> I still have the scars and my oldest kid is 35 years old. So <laughs> I kid, of course. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, I really appreciate it. And we'll talk again soon. David Ferguson is our guest tonight from Lockley Distillery, Ayrshire, Scotland. Their first single malt, the Lockley single malt, will be out around the end of the year. And uh, the core range sometime in early 2022. Thank you again for watching tonight. Uh, we will have more on the podcast this weekend. It's a holiday weekend here in the States, but uh, 
That doesn't mean we don't do a whiskey cast. We do it every week, rain, shine, holiday or not. No matter what happens, dogs barking, cats meowing, it is what it is. Thanks for watching. Take care of each other. Good night, all.